Since the beginning of time, the little Kanama flowed from the forests of the Alleghenies to the valley below. Its journey uninterrupted until the coming of man. Here in the 1860s and 70s, in the level floodplain where the little Kanama meets the Stony Creek, the city of Johnstown had thundered to life with the coming together of coal and steel. In the year 1889, the population had reached 30,000, packed so tight there was scarcely room to build more. At the center of things was the Cambria Iron Company. With its Bessemer plant working night and day, Cambria made steel rails, barbed wire, and plowshares. They worked 10 and 12 hour a day shifts, six days a week, sometimes seven. The valley was full of smoke and the city glowed 24 hours a day with the fires of progress. Cambria alone employed 7,000 men, and at $1.50 a day, a person was doing well. Compared with other industrial towns, the leaders in Johnstown were progressive, even paternalistic. At the pay window on Saturday, a man wore his best suit out of respect for the job he had and his pride in the community. It was a city with a future. There were already 70 phones in town, 27 churches, 123 saloons, three newspapers, a new company hospital, two railroad stations, and up-to-date fire departments. Downtown, there were new blocks, and the stores carried the latest merchandise brought in on the main line from Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia. In the spring of 1889, there was little on the main street of Johnstown that would give rise to speculation there was a life anywhere else. But 14 miles up the valley, there was indeed another life going on. And it was a very different life. It was known by the 61 members who were invited to join as the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. But to everyone else, the place was largely a mystery. Its summer homes and outbuildings half hidden beyond the shoreline. Their owners referred to them as cottages. And from their deep porches, there was a stunning view of a man-made mountain lake. Here on weekends and during the summer months, they spent time together away from Pittsburgh. Here in the gentle woods, even the very hottest days were comfortable under the big trees. Here young men and women could stroll and boat with those of their own kind. Here, protected by the privacy of their land, they were free from the intrusions of the outside world. Bothered only on occasion by those who worked the grounds and maintained the dam. It was a dam built and abandoned by the state of Pennsylvania over 20 years earlier and subsequently neglected by later owners that now demanded the club's attention. Its previous owners had taken little interest in making it safe. And as for the club's part, 
they had removed as much as three feet from its center to enable their carriages to pass. Considering the problems at the dam more bothersome than alarming, the club engaged in periodic maintenance, filling leaks and weak points with mud, rocks, brush, and manure. Of most concern was that the spillway was now only four feet lower than the top of the dam, creating the possibility that a heavy rain could overfill the spillway and cause water to crest over the dam's weakest point, the center. But for those who came to get away from the city, the spillway represented a magic place to meet and to picnic. People like Henry Phipps, who at the time was one of the most important men in Pittsburgh. Or Andrew Mellon, still a frail looking young man in his 30s or Andrew Carnegie, whose business genius would leave an indelible impression on the American landscape. Out of Pittsburgh they came, leaving behind a world they had the luxury to escape. It was an attractive idea for people like Philander Knox and other of the best people in Pittsburgh to buy a piece of tranquility in the quiet mountains away from the city dirt and smoke. It probably was of small interest to them that they bought a share in a lake and a dam in which problems lay below the surface. The dam had already failed once, and a previous owner had sold the discharge pipes for scrap. It was now impossible to relieve the pressure on the dam, or to drain the lake for repairs. Knowingly or unknowingly, what the members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club had purchased was a neglected dam in which they were not willing to invest money for repairs. If the rains came, there was still the spillway. Even if that, too, had been compromised by the introduction of floats and screens to keep the game fish from escaping. It started on May 28th, somewhere over Kansas and Nebraska. And within 24 hours, it had reached the already rain-soaked slopes of the Alleghenies. At Lake Conema, eight inches had fallen. Streams were forming that had never been seen before. Rivers were rising at better than a foot an hour. In Johnstown, there was water in the streets. And though this was not new, this time things seemed more ominous. Two eastbound trains, the Chicago Limited and a freight from Derry, got as far as South Fork, where they were now being held. Word came down that there was trouble at Lily. Bear Run had risen more than six feet and washed out a quarter mile of track. The Day Express, with 90 passengers plus crew, was being held at East Connemaw for further orders. Nothing now could move either east or west. With telegraph lines down, 
trackmen were out searching for the trouble. When club superintendent Elias Unger awoke that morning, he saw that the lake had risen almost two feet overnight and was rising an inch every ten minutes. Most owners had not yet arrived or stayed away. The spillway could not handle more water, a problem made worse by the debris that was now accumulating around the club's fish streams. Unger saw other problems. Old wounds were reopening. At 11.30, John Park left the dam in hopes of getting a warning message to Johnstown. In the meantime, Unger had gathered a crew. He was attempting to free the spillway and raise the top of the dam. Park reached South Fork, and his warning was delivered to telegraph operator Emma Ehrenfeld. With lines down, she could only send it four miles down the line to W.H. Pickerel at Mineral Point. It warned that the water was running over the breast of the dam in center and west side, and was becoming dangerous. At Mineral Point, Pickerall had found a passing track man to deliver the message to the AO Tower, a mile and a half, down the track. had finally reached the AO Tower to be forwarded to East Connemaw and Agent Frank Deckard in Johnstown. It was now between noon and one o'clock. It would be the first of three warnings sent down the valley that day. Time was 3.10 p.m., May 31st, 1889. Located on a hillside, South Fork escaped annihilation. like a dam, but for a few moments. Ah! Ah! 
Engineer John Hess, escaping the water before him, ran backward using his whistle to warn the people of East Connemont. Within a period of 10 minutes, the center of the city had been swept away. Twenty-two hundred men, women and children were dead. Something stood. The ironworks was still there. Then slowly, the living emerged from the ruins. For those who had been spared, there was the paralyzing fear of not knowing what part of their life remained in the valley. At the stone bridge, it had been a night of indescribable horrors. The smell of burning flesh still hung among the wreckage. 500 people had been driven into the bridge and the burning heap. Thousands buried in the mud. One out of every three bodies found would never be identified. living came together, men asking of wives, women asking of husbands, children seeking mothers and fathers. Ninety-nine whole families had been wiped out. One hundred and twenty-four women were left widows. Ninety-eight children had lost both parents. 198 men lost their wives. One woman lost her husband and seven children. One man, his wife, father, and eight children. Now some were leaving. 
their homes and families broken. But most were determined to stay. Within hours, they had called meetings, selected leaders, organized work crews, deputized a police force, established a hospital and a morgue. They had set out to rebuild their town. By railroad, thousands of men and tons of machinery and supplies arrived. Working seven days and nights, crews replaced the great stone viaduct that had disappeared only a few days earlier. From every part of the country, hundreds of volunteers arrived and with the militia and state agencies set to work to prevent epidemics and relieve the suffering. One of the most impressive rescue efforts was headed by a little woman. Clara Barton, competitive, persistent, never left Johnstown for five months. Within weeks, the Red Cross and other agencies had built housing and distribution centers, making it possible for thousands to get a foothold on life again. But what was most remarkable was the people themselves. Within days, they had reported for work, fired the furnaces, and set the lathes going again. For days and weeks, they would live in the mud and under a pall of burning debris. But no one now questioned that out of this would rise a new city. The only question was how long it would take. And always, why did it happen? They were gone, and they would not return, leaving for the living only memories of a life once lived on the mountain, of a life once lived in the valley.